Okay, let's begin. Welcome to today's event, the latest in Transportation Insights Digital Master Series. We're here today to talk about parcel shipping and share some advice on steps you can take to build a market-proof winning strategy. I'm Michael Willard in the Marketing Division at Transportation Insight. We've invited a panel of our parcel shipping experts to join us today. Before we turn it over to our panel, I want to remind our audience we welcome your participation. Please submit your questions for our panelists. You can do that in the GoToWebinar questions panel. We're gonna take as many questions as possible at the conclusion of our presentation, maybe address some during the presentation. And of course, anything we don't get to, we'll follow up directly after our broadcast. We're gonna hand that broadcast over now to our moderator for the event, Robin Meyer. Robin's Transportation Insight Vice President of Parcel Solutions. She has over 20 years of experience working in the transportation management space. Robin brings a problem-solving mindset that helps clients work across their interconnected supply chain to achieve competitive advantage, gain efficiencies, mitigate risk, and of course, improve customer experience. Welcome to the conversation today, Robin. Let's begin with an introduction of our other experts. Thanks, Michael, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, as we discussed on the preview, we will be talking a little bit about the regional carriers today and, and really shipping capacity during peak season. So what options you have out there along with regional carriers, but also in addition to regional carriers and how we help you really solve those problems and what we're seeing in the market. We've got Todd Benz joining us today. Todd is the Senior Vice President of Parcel Solutions here at Transportation Insight. He has 36 years in the parcel industry of experience. He entered the parcel industry really right before it was deregulated by the federal government and has seen a rapid change from a majority of commercial shipping to a massive e-commerce delivery vehicle. Todd will be giving us a deeper dive look at the state of the parcel market today. We also have Brian Broadhurst. Brian is our Vice President of Transportation Solutions. His experience really spans all modes from both the shippers and the carrier's perspective. His primary roles at TI are really maintaining legacy customer solutions, as well as introducing new opportunities and solutions that address issues in the small parcel marketplace. Brian's going to dive into what's happening in terms of alternative parcel carriers and how those carriers can mesh within your existing platform. So first, let's turn to Todd for a quick market assessment and a state of the nation. Thank you very much, Robin. Well, as you can tell that uh, COVID has just uh, really put a lot of pressure on all of these, these networks, especially with when we're looking at the large um, uh, nationals, the two largest, FedEx and UPS, they have been uh, put in quite a position. Not only has the network gone from about a 50% in 2019, 50% commercial delivery to where now it's 72% residential. And what that means is the network, that when it was originally set up, was set up as a commercial delivery. And now entering into the world of e-commerce and really pressuring the networks, being able to manage that and, and just the sheer size of the volume that's increased. Um, it's been a uh, unbelievable two years, basically almost with COVID. I've never seen anything like it in my, in my life. Even the uh, 1994 strike of LTL, which taxed the network again, did nothing compared to what we have in COVID. So it's been um, a really uh, unbelievable trying time in regards to all shipping, but especially when it comes to small package, there's been a lot of tension. So if you take a look at where we sit today, one of the amazing things is if you it's a it's amazing when you start to look at this right here in that UPS is at 21 million packages a day more. Amazon's over 20 million, FedEx is over 18 million, and this is not peak season volume. This is just the volume that they're running at right now. And um, so they're in the buildup for what's coming for this year's peak. And one of the interesting points here is that we enter with the regional carriers, and the regional carriers have become a bigger, bigger player in the world due to COVID, really, and it's allowed them to have massive expansion quickly. So if you go back to 2010-ish, 
where we would have maybe around 3% of the marketplace was regional carriers. Now we're in double digit as far as market share for regional carriers. It's allowed um, many of the carriers to expand uh, more so than at any other time in the existence of transportation. I came in at the very beginning of deregulation, right? So I was hired in, in the world of transportation because the world just expanded in parcel. So UPS grew 60 plus thousand jobs in the 80s and deregulation was the big a catalyst for that. And what we saw was a lot of companies go under and new ones come up. And what you see here in this COVID situation is extremely similar to that in that it's been able to give entrepreneurs a chance to open up and basically fire up uh, um, you know, final mile delivery, which has become, you know, a, a big hot button, but it's also become an area that can help many of our customers fit the, fit the need of capacity. So I think one of the big things that we see going on here is just the ability of having more choices in the market. And Brian, you're one of the ones that has had, you know, your ear to the grindstone when it comes to regional carriers. So we'd love to have your take on this. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's a great point. And I think, Robin, we have a poll question around this, correct? Yes, we do. Um, so before you get started, Brian, let's ask the audience, how many parcel carriers do you believe there are in the market today? Um, everyone take a few seconds to choose what you think is the correct answer, and then we'll share, we'll share the actual answer with you shortly. Perfect, so, and while that's getting pulled up, Todd, to echo your point, capacity really is the driving reason why the regionals are showing a lot more influence in the market right now. Um, there's, they are a proven way to move freight. A lot of them have been in business for decades. They're expanding into new territories. And really, they're now getting to points where they're going to be at capacity as well. We have a lot of the regional carriers are now saying for peak season this year, they're at capacity. They won't onboard any new carriers. And that was really the impetus as to where they got their market share. But I don't think that's all, right? If we look at this slide on the screen here, you can see the number of states and areas where regionals will service. And they're not all encompassing. A lot of these states aren't 100% serviced by the regional carrier outlined in the slide. But the vast majority of the country can be serviced by a regional carrier or by a combination of regional carriers. And that has really driven the influence. There's once the capacity levels off, and our view is that it's never going to fully level off, they will already be integrated with a lot of shippers. And once you're integrated with a shipper, it is much easier to, to be a linchpin in their, in their solution, and they'll continue to get freight. So I think the capacity drove it, but it, it's here to stay. And there's a number of reasons why it'll remain. First and foremost, a lot of times, historically, it's been a cost play, it's been more economic. You know, FedEx and UPS are very advanced at structuring their, their contracts, so they get the volume they want, and if it falls under a certain threshold, there's effectively a charge for that to ensure they get the volume they want in their market share and they can keep that. But they've been very transparent to their credit that they are at capacity in a number of areas. They're going to be short during peak, and they've been very open with what that is and going to customers with what they can service. And so that's allowed regional carriers to play a part in fixing the solution without taking business away from UPS and FedEx that they want. It really can be looking at a solution for above and beyond the minimum requirements from a shipping perspective. And then in many cases, regional carriers, they are, are more flexible to work with. And there's a lot of funding going into this space to help capacity solutions thrive from new entrants to funding to allow regional carriers to expand so that has been a definite differentiator this year as well. And then the last that I'll add is for a lot of our clients, we see it as contingency planning. Historically, the regional carriers was tremendously, how do we allow a cost reduction for certain areas of the country where we operate with good density and a coverage by a single regional carrier? And that's shifted a bit in recent years, whereas we always need to be financially viable. But if, if you're talking about an extra dollar per package, versus losing the $100 sale, that really is top of mind to a lot of shippers. And so in many cases, it can be a lower cost solution, but even if it's slightly more expensive and 
a large scale shipper implements it for a small portion of their business, a small portion surcharge and a small portion of their volume is, is something they can accept, but it gives them that flexibility to have another solution during capacity constrained times that they can expand and grow and ensure they get freight to their customers. So that's really a lot of what's driven regional carriers and beyond to enter this space in a good market for them to be a part of that. Yeah, definitely. And, and I know just during my experience here in the parcel arena, you know, it, it started out originally that a lot of shippers were really kind of staying away from the regional carriers, right? There were several very large ones that, that you could utilize. When you look at the map, you'll notice that, you know, it's a little typical around metropolitan areas, but there are about 150 um, regional carriers out there to choose from. And I know it's really um, misunderstood in the market, and you can see that even within our poll result, results, you know, 17% were all that chose really the correct group of regional carriers. So when you look at the opportunity with regionals, you know, it definitely has become more main place, right? And there are a lot of options out there, but they've been in business for decades. And so, Todd, can you give kind of a brief historic overview of how the regional carriers came to play and, and you know, what the service areas are, et cetera? So, yeah, absolutely. So the regional carriers definitely grew into this. And it's, I mean, many of them have been around 40 years. And it's, uh, again, an example of where uh, deregulation took place, giving carriers the ability to go after business without having all the regulation into it. Just real quick, uh, when I started with UPS, you could not actually uh, pick up a package in the state of Texas and deliver it in Texas. It, they weren't allowed. They didn't have the rights to operate. And so you, you think about that, and that was in the early 80s. And so um, not until uh, 1986 did they get the right to pick up and deliver in the state of in the state of Texas. And so they used to have to run those packages up to Oklahoma City and back. So when you think of that, you can see where when deregulation came in, there was a lot of opportunity in certain areas because of the, what Brian had mentioned was density. And many of these cust uh, carriers evolved based on the need, and the majority of them started it that uh, started you know, 35, 40 years ago, were started as commercial shippers. And so they were commercial delivery uh, intent on the last mile. And most of it was centered around uh, a quick service turn and the need for some additional flexibility around the pickup and delivery. And so this kind of uh, morphed into where we have it today. So you can see, you know, OnTrack was uh, been around a long time, Speedy, uh, LSO, uh, laser ship. So many of these have been with us and we have seen many more morph quickly, especially in the last two years uh, through COVID. So yeah, so one of the one of the important things, Todd, and I'm sure Brian can echo this, is when you're looking at the opportunity to leverage regional carriers, as well as some of the optional ones we'll talk about in a little bit, you've really got to make sure you have your alignment to your network understood, right? So where you can consider plugging into those regionals or those alternative carriers. And you have to look at complexity and how able is your company up a regional option, especially the closer we get to peak, right? Some regionals have already announced they're booked out for peak season. So, you know, Brian, what do you see as opportunities for customers that really don't have a, a regional set up and it's going to be difficult to do that, but they need something for peak or for even 2022? Uh, it's a great question because there's a ton of complexity behind it, right? So we've We've been in the business for a long time of implementing regional solutions and the line haul that needs to inject into a certain regional carrier, um, spreading the cost of the truck over all the packages on that line haul. And then there's all the direct relationships that you have with each of the final mile carriers. And so if you're going to three different parts of the country, you might have three different regional carriers to work with, plus three different line hauls on three different carriers. And then you get into the invoicing and the various tracking numbers. And there, there's a ton of complexity behind it. We, we know it makes sense from a physical flow perspective. We know it's, it works from a capacity solution during peak and beyond. We know it's paramount, but there are a ton of moving parts. And I think those are really what our customers are saying they need to help solve for. 
But the good news is a lot of that you don't have to do fully on your own. Like we're, we're actively working with customers to solve those many moving parts for them and combine all the pieces we're doing and even getting into more of the execution side of it where we are ourselves helping operate the line haul and helping getting it to the right regional carrier. And I think that's really the key piece is to start looking at it now to look at where are you operating, where are your origins, where are your destinations, what is your delivery density, and working with a partner of any, any kind that can actually help you identify that flow, help you with the technology integration piece, which we're also very comfortable with, and then also just moving it into that, who is the final mile provider that can move it for you and helping you do that in a speedy way because peaks around the corner, the payment process could be a ton of moving parts and speed at this point is, is definitely of the essence to get a solution in place before peak season is really causing an issue from a supply chain delivery perspective. Well, and I think another point to make, you know, I get called quite often asking, you know, what are some some good regional carriers? What are some options yep. that I go and look at? Because when you go to the phone book or you go on a website, you know, we talked about there's 150 plus, right? So which ones are the ones that actually have good carrier performance and which ones are the ones that, you know, I'd want delivering my package and giving my customer that in state, that customer experience, right? And so I think that's, that's important as well. I know from a, a client perspective that we've been building out a number of solutions for clients that help them diversify their carriers, whether to avoid volume caps or look at pricing or improve time in transit. Um, can, can you and Todd speak a little bit to an example of how we've helped a client who's basically single sourced with FedEx um, or UPS to split volume really between the major carriers? But before you, before you answer that, let me go to a survey really quick. So from a regional carrier perspective, if you're not currently leveraging regional carriers today, what is your primary reason? Is that you really feel it would be cost prohibitive? Do you think that it's too hard to implement? You don't have enough shipment volume or you feel like your shipping locations aren't conducive to using regional carriers? Um, because these are the things we hear the most from our clients and prospects in terms of concerns while considering a regional carrier. So while our audience answers this survey, Todd, do you want to give one or two examples of, of how we've helped out uh, clients recently to diversify and look at alternatives? Yes, absolutely. So the one uh, one right now comes to mind. So uh, this really began at the beginning of, of, of COVID in 2020. And, and as they were ramping up, starting to realize that there could be issues coming into peak season of 2020, one of the things that we did immediately was figure out a um, a plan for for basically zone skipping. And what we looked at doing was, because it's kind of, you gotta think about this, nobody knew COVID was coming. So we had already planned a, a pullback and a redesign of distribution centers. And one of them happened to be that we were collapsing it. And then we were gonna pull it into a larger uh, uh, distribution center. Well, all this kind of happened at the same time COVID did, so we had to come up with a plan because the national carrier that was supporting them at the time immediately said they're going to cap. It. So what we did is, to what Brian had spoke about earlier, we went ahead and what we did was we came up with a zone skip plan, lined up with the line haul, and then went back with a plan to the national carrier and said, we understand you have issues with capacity, really centered around um, um, equipment. They weren't gonna have enough equipment. And so what if we brought it closer to you and brought it into your uh, facility that was going to be able to be delivered for this zone two and three um, merchandise? That was our first stance. Then what we did is as we rolled into 2021, our plan was, okay, that was successful. Now let's look at being successful with a regional carrier. So we started a regional carrier play on the West Coast and uh, one on the East Coast, and now we're working on one for the uh, Southeast, Southwest. And what that does for the customer is, is it happened to be um, uh, financially uh, rewarding, but the real key was it was capacity because now they've gained an enormous amount of capacity 
because now they've been able to spread that. So 2021 should be a much smoother peak season than 2020 was. And we're not kind of like uh, um, running around in a fire drill. <laughs> um, the second example I want to give you is where this is an example where we had the capability of looking at a lot of different solutions for a particular e-commerce shipper online. And what we did on this issue is we saw an opportunity to bring in postal consolidators, not only they're just the national, main national carrier, but then being able to look at a postal, uh, postal consolidation solution and regional carrier solution, all tied together to where they could look at utilizing options within their network for the solutions to help them be able to gain the capacity that was being, um, I don't want to say threatened, but more or less the, the capacity was going to be taken away or could be taken away. This way they built in the extra capacity, which allows them to have more sales going in through peak season. They don't have to think about any uh, kind of curtailing of merchandise or sales because they have the capacity to move the merchandise and get it to the end customer. Now, these are examples of two large customers, but there's some other solutions for smaller customers. I know, Brian, you you have some ideas around that as well. Yeah, well, for sure. And it, 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 I'm sorry, Brian. One thing I just want to point out really quickly, um, you know, is understanding the technology that you really have to have and the visibility to look at all of these different carriers, whether it's a complex shipper from many many different locations or a lot of volume to a small shipper it's really important that you have that visibility and that business intelligence when you're looking at a complex solution right so brian i know you're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the smaller opportunities there but i just wanted to point that out as an important piece no they're all great points like on the, on the visibility piece i think if you don't see the current state how do you operate operate the future state the, the analogy i've heard in the business with a couple top tier visibility companies in the, in the industry is you need to turn the lights on first in the room and then you can kind of clean it up and so if you don't see what's happening in real or near real time you can't really understand how to clean it up and, the, and you clean it up through exactly what todd mentioned looking at where the freight needs is starting looking at where it needs to go running the network strategy to actually understand where is the origin destination line haul what should be injected all that mo financial modeling and network modeling and then you know really what you need to do to actually improve it and then you get into the equally hard piece of actually executing upon that and putting that into real life and there is a, there's a ton of complexity there um, and there's a reason todd's team is in, endorsed to do these analyses and improvements optimizations for clients it's because understanding how it moves is extremely hard work and you really need to be tied into the industry and the carriers to find the right partners to, to do the delivery and then it's equally hard to execute and i think that's in a lot of our customers especially when they get to the smaller side that is the big pain point pain point we're seeing is we know it needs to be done but we need but we need to turn it on ahead of peak and how do we do that so it's seamless to our customer? How do we provide visibility across all of the shipping providers without dealing with a variety of tracking numbers and systems and payments and invoicing, et cetera? And really what they're coming to us for on, the, on, that, on that side of the house is how do we simplify all those moving parts into one manageable interface? And that's where we're starting to add a ton of value and moving away from simply the negotiations of the contracts, but how do we implement the new solution? And how, if we create the interface for it, can we replicate that across a thousand clients and spread the workload and start to make it make sense for everybody? And then from the operations side, when you get to the smaller origin volumes, it's really an operational solution like a consolidation. And that is when we combine a number of commingled freight to get it to the right place. So all of those are really top of mind to our customers. How do we simplify it? How do we spread a lot of the work to make it an easy to digest and implement solution ahead of peak season? And how do we leverage the advantage we as a company have of knowing a number of clients that all have similar pain points that can combine to do it better together than they would apart? I think that's one of the values in having somebody you can kind of see across shippers, across carriers and have the right partnerships in place. 
Yep. So when, when you talk about simplifying um, in terms of the results from the survey, and Brian, I think you've touched on some of these, but maybe based on the specific point, you could give a little bit more color to each one. So 50% of the attendees say it would be too difficult to implement a regional carrier model. Um, so let's talk about that one first from the difficulty perspective. You know, what do you see as opportunity there? Yeah, it, it's a good point. I mean, there's, we are actively in the business of solving this for our clients, everything from what regional carriers do you use? How do you move freight to those regional carriers? What is the technology to track the package? How, who do you rely on for the execution support? And then the invoicing, those are really the main key pieces all the way from Tinder to payment of how hard it is to turn on a, a carrier. And I think work, you, you need to leverage a partner who knows that space. Um, we are advisors to inform clients how to do that. We also do a lot of that on their behalf. We're in the business of moving freight as an overall company. And so I think that is using the right partner who's familiar with the analysis stage all the way through the execution stage will make that a much easier solution for shippers to implement ahead of peak season. Agreed, agreed. Well, and 38% and of the group said that shipping lo their shipping locations wouldn't work, while 13% said there's really not enough volume. And, and what I want to say here is, you know, you may be under the assumption that you have to have a specific amount of volume, a specific location, but there are a lot of alternatives to really getting your packages to the place that they would need to be in order to be able to take advantage of a regional carrier or an alternative carrier. And there's also opportunities, just as Brian mentioned, when you look at, say, possible consolidation areas or areas where you could you know, drive volume in specific areas, there's definitely opportunities there. I think the important thing as Brian mentioned, is really turning the light on, right? I think it's really important to understand the way that you're shipping and how you're leveraging your network really impacts costs, right? And, and everyone, I get called all the time asking, you know, how do I determine my freight costs? How do I look at my revenues? What's profitable and what's not? And so really having the visibility into that type of information, no matter if you're a small shipper or you're a multi-million dollar shipper, right? It's gonna be really impactful to know what's costing me money to ship, Am I doing it the right way? And am I leveraging the best carrier to get the benefit of time in transit and cost effectiveness? So when you look at that from a, a, a perspective of regionals on alternatives, I mean, Todd, what are your thoughts on, you know, getting an idea on the, the regional carriers and what the opportunities are there for a small shipper? We've talked about complex, but let's just dig into small really quickly. So really what the big focus would be is, is it's all about the data and understanding exactly what's uh, transpiring. And one of the things that I would look at is the, uh, how it's set up currently with the, uh, your current distribution, your current time in transit, right? And how are you reaching that time in transit? And um, what's the actual um, on-time performance of the carrier that you're using at this time? So we could walk in and come up with the possibility of using a different, uh, a different model. And one of the things to think about in this arena is you don't necessarily have to build a direct full trailer to the destination. I think that's a, a misnomer, is that um, the one thing great about working with regional carriers is their flexibility and their willingness to engage different um, uh, injection um, methods and how you actually inject into the regional carrier. So, you know, unfortunately, there's not a silver bullet. So the way I always envision it is, is you got to put in the legwork, figure out what can be done and come up with the different scenarios and recommendations. A lot of times it's a little bit of, you know, let's test this. We'll make an adjustment here, fine tune that. And then, you know, we've got the final product running. So I guess the, the, the point is uh, there's options to embrace to look at this. Um, just real quick, one of the first ones that comes to my mind is looking at the, the, the ability to, to utilize LTL is, quote, your line, line haul. And, um, you know, that's one of the things that 
TI does extremely well. So one of the things I would look at is um, the possibility of that. There's also different uh, services that some of these consolidators offer that might fit based on the characteristics of the packaging. So it's always a characteristics play, not only the customer's customer, but the package themselves, right? And then of course, where's it going in tied to the United States lends itself to, to more possibilities. I, you know, the one thing is, is that uh, um, I guess the older you get, the more you say, never say never. <laughs> be so much change that, um, I, you know, I, I would uh, recommend any of the customers that, you know, never say never. There's, it might not work at this junction, but in the near future, things are changing so rapidly, especially technology, that offerings will uh, be uh, in front of them shortly. Right, definitely. I mean, I remember back, you know, in the before pre-COVID time where invoice data was was definitely good, but to have, you know, in day and every 15 minute updates wasn't even heard of that much unless you were pinging the carrier site yourself. And now to be able to get that visibility from all carriers, whether they're regional or hybrid or national, is something that everyone's looking for and wanting, right? And something that we're providing to clients today. So when you look at, um, at this webinar, you know, there's really three main key takeaways. So the first takeaway is, you know, shippers are struggling with unbudgeted price increases. Um, we've seen impacts from large price increases. I mean, we have clients that are getting calls of 30 to 40% price increases from the national carriers to request that shippers leverage supply chain share in the cost from increased labor markets. We have clients that are receiving emails asking to help pay some of this labor force. And I know you all, because we here at TIR are probably struggling to find employees and people that, that would like to work, right? And so with all of that information, understanding all of your options and how to diversify your carrier network is extremely important. So being prepared, you know, be the boy, the boy scout, right? Be prepared. And when you're prepared, then you really have an understanding of what are my options? How do I diversify my network? And really what alternatives are there out there? Um, and so it's really important to be prepared. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the good news is that you as a shipper are not the only ones one facing the capacity issues today. It is a industry-wide phenomenon that everybody is dealing with, and all the way from the shipper side through the supplier side of new entrants entering to help solve that for you. And it, it's really, really paramount to make sure you're keeping a pulse on what are those new entrants, or that you have a partner who can flag that for you because they're naturally watching the industry anyway. I know we as a company that is top of mind from, from top level down is to keep an eye on new entrants that can be a solution. And, and we can always flag the ones that may or may not make sense for you. Uh, but at the end of the day, I would say we're simply in an unprecedented time. Like we're more capacity constrained than ever. USPS for the first time in 35 years is actively reviewing contracts. UPS and FedEx are saying they're at capacity. Regional carriers are now saying they're at capacity. And then there's new entrants entering the market every week. And that's a lot to keep up with. And the supply chain final mile is now getting more attention than ever. There's, we, we've heard that, seen that in the news more in the past year than we have in the past decade. And a lot of that is because for the shippers, that final mile is actually going to the end consumer's house. So it's a true customer interaction. It's a customer experience. And that's top of mind. So with all that being said, the key thing is to think ahead start to work with a partner who can manage all that for you is, is critical. And I, I referenced earlier all the moving parts from technical in integration through final mile partners. And we have a tremendous amount of experience in that space. We're actively implementing solutions for customers. And I, I personally welcome any opportunity to speak with anybody who's trying to solve for that. I know our, our contact information will be out in here in a few minutes, but those to me are, are the key items that shippers need to have a pulse on to solve for capacity in peak season, but candidly, the capacity issues that are going to continue beyond peak. 
And so the other area I would say is the uh, stabilization of the network. And, you know, everything is being tied back to the struggle for, for maintaining staffing. And everyone is in competition for this um, finite body that we are struggling to, to, to get back into the workforce. And uh, it's, it's, everyone is, is facing this difficulty and it's really being pushed to the forefront with when it comes to the carriers. You can see the carriers are all struggling to make sure they maintain and staff these facilities. You know, the single mile, the final mile um, delivery um, execution, remember, they're basically um, performing the sortation uh, at the uh, local level, men out for delivery and pickup. And the large national have a much more complex network in place that requires a, an enormous amount of staff. Everyone's seen that uh, um, every you know UPS and FedEx are, are looking to hire uh, you know 100,000, 80,000. Amazon's in the same position. That's an enormous amount of uptick for a short, very short period of time coming in when you really think about it. But it's just an enormously mass uh, impact. To, to the United States, I mean, and the globe. Um, it's just, uh, uh, it, we, we took it for granted for so long because the capacity existed. And so when peak season came, the carriers already had that inherent capacity built. And then the, would just the network could absorb that six week period. And now we're going into these periods of massive uh, peak season with the networks already reaching to the point of capacity. And so the shortfall um, in volume is less this year, we think, than it was last year. But still, the difficulty that we see is probably more on the uh, shipper side. And the stability side of it is really focused on, you know, developing these operating plans. One of the things that uh, I think that was uh, uh, um, learned early in my career in transportation that having a master operating plan and making sure that everybody on the, on, the, on the staff and on the crew understands what the plan of action is and where, what's, you know, basically, uh, what's the breakdown plan, so to speak? When something does go wrong, what is my plan B? and how do I have it set up and having it documented and laid out and instructions on how this can be performed is very uh, very critical, more so than ever. And I think the Brian's point that he had spoken about as far as uh, unforeseen times and COVID, I think we have to um, be prepared that as we come through uh, living with COVID, uh, you know, we're, we're just gonna have to learn to deal and live with COVID. And so what I think we're, approaching is the new norm that will come out that we are in it's going to be a little different than we are living in right now however one of the the big things that we're going to be faced with is the um, adversity that's constantly appearing and just around the corner as we go in and we think we're coming out of covid there could be something on the horizon again so it's something for us just to you know if anything change is inevitable and we just have to be prepared and so uh when it's pitched to us that we uh <laughs> we're ready to take the swing yeah so so we have a lot of questions um we probably should just schedule a webinar with questions honestly oh. <laughs> so, so i'm gonna i'm gonna go down the list here um for you all so so i the first one is i actually received a price increase of 43 percent from one of the national carriers What's my option because I'm primarily a commercial shipper, which I know that's different than what we've seen in the market a lot, but um, what would be the options there? I know, Brian, from a regional capacity standpoint and what they typically look at, um, we've got a question around ugly freight too. So maybe you could wrap those two together, ugly freight and commercial delivery, and then Todd will get a little bit more info from you. Yeah, and I think one of the the intangible values we have is really understanding the cost structure of the national carriers and what are the levers that make 
the costing, what the costing is. So we always caveat that we'll want to look at your exact profile to understand everything from delivery density to package size, the pro shipping profile, et cetera, to confirm it. But in all likelihood, there, the more, as you're more commercial, that is a better position to be in. So that will allow a number of regional carriers. There are some regional carriers that rely on or focus more on residential. And there are some that are more commercial in nature as well. And then I mentioned earlier all the new entrants in the market that we're watching. And a number of those that we're partnering with are focused on the larger size packages, what some might call ugly freight, but really it's just ugly for UPS as conveyor is really what, what that means. Um, and there's some that's, that's a little bit less clean and, and that, that, that could be an issue, but a lot of that is just that it isn't optimized for their automated systems. So finding the right provider who's focused on your profile is really the key. Um, we, from a regional carrier perspective, we really do have a variety, a ton that are focused on the good freight, smaller size residentials, but they're also going to be at capacity pretty soon as well. Um, with the capacity crunch, what that's allowed regional carriers to do is that they're entitled to also pick the freight that benefits them the best because they're going to be moving all of that anyway. That has had the trickle down effect of forcing new entrants for the other volume out there. And we're actually working with who those customers are and we can effectively consolidate the move to, to make sure you can get to the right providers depending on the geography in the area without you having to manage all the individual pieces we mentioned earlier. So I think those are the key things. There's definitely negotiation play in some cases. We'd have to see your volume to know what that is. Um, but what we can say without even looking at the data is that there are other providers out there. And depending on your volume, we can cross check that against our carrier base and see who is a fit to move it away from UPS and FedEx. The interesting piece there is always this baseline discussion, right? There are some customers that have this legacy grandfathered in extremely good rate for volume that was implemented before the carrier started to push that volume out of the network. So there's always that discussion of what truly is the baseline for savings versus cost avoidance. But at the end of the day, it's a real issue that you need to find another solution for. There are other folks out there and, and we can help identify who overlaps your network. Yeah, and I, I think an important thing too when looking at that 43%, right, is are they are they looking at that across your entire delivery base or are they looking at that maybe basing on the residential or your growth or your divert into e-com, right? And so we've seen a lot of shippers that have gone from primarily to commercial to now more of a residential delivery. And so if you're diverting back or you're going back to commercial now, you know, post COVID, which right now isn't really post, but we're seeing a lot of shippers go back to their original way they shipped, then it's definitely something to look at and it's something to communicate to the carrier too. They may, may be under the impression that you've changed your network for good, right? And so really looking at that opportunity um, and seeing if that's a true case and if they're basing that price increase on steady state or current market. And I don't know, Todd, if you have anything else to add on that. No, no, I think you guys nailed it. But I just one thing I would just mention there is is that one of the things that have transpired since COVID, and it had been creeping in, is that the networks for UPS and FedEx have changed. And with a more, you know, if you think about um, just going back 20 years, you're looking at the network being set up at 15% residential and 85% commercial, and now you know, 72% residential, right? So I think one of the things that um, the carriers are looking at more and more when it comes to commercial is that type of commercial characteristics of the package, right? And then the delivery and seeing how it rolls in as far as its characteristics. Does it match more of a residential type delivery or is it truly more of a commercial type uh, play and those are the things that uh, have to be investigated so you can actually defend your position better and stronger by understanding what's going to be driving that cost at the carrier. Yeah. One of the other questions that we received, um, you showed a slide on Amazon delivery versus FedEx and UPS. 
what kind of time frame do you see in them actually coming back out to the market and offering delivery for non Amazon packages? What are your thoughts there? And then do you think they will be a viable solution uh, nationally as a competitor, UPS and FedEx? Todd, do you want to take that one? So it's a great question because we did see them prior to COVID doing a beta test on customer base where they were doing the pickup and they were going out making the delivery. Then COVID hit and they um, basically had to cut those customers off. And so those customers had to go back to the national um, and, and, and basically piece together their transportation uh, agreement so that they would have national coverage. Um, the situation that I see uh, in the near future is I hate to say status quo because COVID has made nothing status quo, but I see that Amazon's going to continue to deliver their own product lines, or I should say their own fulfillment lines, and that they um, are probably going to start back into this, but I don't see that, in, in my opinion, probably until like 2023. Um, is what I'm, I'm, you know, guessing, and it may even be after that. I think that we have to get over this hurdle of uh, employment and staffing, and then we can probably come and have that discussion again to see how that's going to unfold. I do believe that they're going to definitely do it strategically and look at locations in which to launch it, just like they have done pretty much everything. Um, I do see that uh, um, no matter what, uh, there's a Teamster contract that's coming up in July of 2023. Uh, that could add another wrench to the mix. So um, just have to, it's just another example that uh, it's never ending in, in um, adversity. I mean, you, you got to be adapt and, and improvise and overcome. As, <laughs> so, um, so in terms of we're seeing a lot of growth uh, in pickup um, partners like Walgreens and Staples. Is that an option for for me as a small shipper? That's one of the questions that we had. Yes, I think I think it definitely is. I think in the same way that a regional carrier is, if you're originating and destined for territory and they service both the origin and the destination i think it absolutely is i think the the risk there is how much of the volume can that perform for you and this is a great angle into there are a ton of somewhat siloed providers in the u.s and if you combine them together they can service the lion's share of of, of the geography right of the population um, but they need to be connected and that's really the big piece because if you happen to have the right origin destination, you can have another solution move for that portion of your volume with one point of contact. But to really move the needle, you need to look at volume moving outside those regions. And this all ties back to what Todd mentioned earlier from the solutions we're designing for customers. And then my add on of where we're actually helping give that user experience in a, in a succinct one-to-many type managed interface and that is really i think when you really start to make the difference of where is the freight going to from what's what can be delivered by those carriers whether it's walmart whether it's regional but your freight needs to get there that's a phenomenal time for us to have a discussion and, and to see how we can help them get it there because it's all about connecting those pieces and having another solution to solve for capacity constraints that we know are going to be around for quite a while well, and Brian, you just mentioned, so one of the other questions that we received was around carrier performance. And the way the question reads is, we saw some pretty crappy carrier performance uh, last <laughs> right. year during peak. So what do you think it will look like this year? And do you think the regionals or these alternatives are actually an option? Do they have the same struggles? Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about last year versus this year, Todd or Brian? Brian, if you want to. So I'll go ahead and say that, you know, if you take a look at last year, um, one of the big things is 
we've uh, they've added more capacity going into this year just based on their own capital expenditures and their um, um, continued uh, expansion of their own networks and so by adding in the capacity and and with the expansion that uh, this peak season has uh, the potential to be smoother than it was last year because last year I mean pretty much everybody got caught off guard and it was you know it was all hands on deck trying to figure out how to keep the, the ship afloat so what I I, I see um, happening this year is that much more um, a, a much more uh, a, a much more a much larger effort toward keeping service and reliability steady and stable. And so that what they're going to do is make sure that their networks are going to be running and they're going to fire up these sorts earlier than they did last year, just for the sole reason they know, they learned. Mm -hmm. And so with that, these they'll go into seven day mode much earlier in the, the beginning of the peak season. And I think that what you'll see with that is they won't be as taxed in the delivery side because the volume will be flowing. And, you know, one of the big disconnects inside these large uh, complex networks is the hub network and making sure the hub network runs smooth because if it disconnects, then it snowballs everything throughout the network. And that's what you see happen and why we had problems with, with service. And so those that's, that's, a, that's a, a big one right there, my take of it. Brian, I don't know if you have a different opinion or. No, no I definitely don't. I think the only color commentary is it, it's not a question of if they'll have capacity. It's it's a question of how far short on capacity will they be. That's always a discussion now. Um, and to Dodd's point, their the regional networks and and the national carrier networks look different. There can be less moving parts if you get it to the right injection point, and so you can bypass some of those issues. So. All of those reasons, I would say regional carriers are absolutely a true option. The, they've been proven more in recent months than, than ever in the past. They know what they're doing. Um, with the right injection areas, there can be less moving parts. There, there's, there's a reason some of them are at capacity. It's because they can service their customers. So I think considering all of those unique options, especially when the other option is not moving your package, I think it's a no-brainer. I would highly advise it, and and it's it's something that everybody should be taking very seriously. Well, and a lot of shippers really, you know, they learned by fire last year in that they yeah. were dependent on the carriers to share their performance around the country and what the expectation was. And a lot of companies and shippers have really invested in technology or visibility platforms this year to allow them to have a better understanding of how the carriers are performing, you know, not only as a whole, but in specific areas of the country. And so we get asked quite often, you know, can I look at this specific metropolitan area and see how on time the carriers are generally and it's not based on the carrier's website whether it be a regional or a consolidator or the postal service or national it's based on you know what we're seeing across the market and that overall you know performance and so understanding that is really good one of the questions i want to make sure we're getting really close to time but i did get a question on you mentioned postal consolidators what are those and how do you work with those so todd can you just give a quick I know we're right at time, but I don't want to leave somebody hanging on that. A quick overview of what a postal consolidator is sure. and what to do. So postal consolidator is basically uh, going to uh, execute a pickup and then do the sortation to go deeper into the post office, either a you know, sectional sorting facility or a, the DDU, which is your local post office. And its intent is to speed that essence, the line haul portion and then drop into the post office so the post office makes the final delivery. The key to remember there is, is you're taking it away from the post office's line haul network and taking it outside. So what these consol the consolidators have done has been able to perform a more uh, efficient, fast sortation to move and jump, I should say jumpstart the uh, line haul and cut some time in transit out of the network. UPS uh, Mail Innovations, is an example of that uh, DHL e-commerce 
is an example of that. OSM Worldwide is an example of that. International Bridge has functionality around that as well. So the, that's a, a big uh, portion of what they can do. So Michael, I know we have a couple other questions, but we're gonna have to follow up with those groups later. So I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Sure, thanks Robin. A lot of great content from you and our other panelists. And of course, we will follow up with those other questions that we have remaining. We'll have our subject matter experts contact you directly as soon as possible to get you those additional details. And so with that, we'll conclude this Transportation Insight Digital Master Series event. To our panel of experts, again, thank you for joining us. Thank you as well to our audience for spending a little bit of time gaining some information about hopefully helping your business improve. For more information or to reach out to our supply chain masters, just use the contact information you see on the screen. Of course, you can also visit us online at transportationinsight.com. That's where you can access more about our solutions, our blogs, resource guides, a lot of information about parcel transportation that will help support your transportation management and supply chain strategy in 2021. On behalf of our panelists and Transportation Insight, thank you for joining our broadcast. May you master the remainder of your day.